Good evening, good evening, good evening. It is just such an awesome delight to be with you today in webinar number 124 with Choose Life International. Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone. It is just so good to have you. And welcome to all our persons who are on YouTube and also on Facebook. And if there's anyone here with us for the first time, welcome, welcome. I see we have Holly, we have, is it Rachel? Yes, okay. And welcome to all those persons who are here with us before. And we just want you to know that we are on the ball, we're starting now, and we're talking about fostering children. So it is important for you to just reach out to your friends, colleagues, neighbors, church, and let them know we are on. And we are going to have a great time talking with Holly and Rachel today. So we're going to begin and I'm going to ask Donna. Donna, would you kindly lead us in prayer? Our Father and God, you are so awesome. And we want to pause to give you all the thanks and the praise this evening. Lord, as we gather together for this interview and webinar, Lord, we pray that your presence will be felt. We pray, Lord, for your direction. We pray for your guidance. We pray, Lord Jesus, that persons will be impacted, motivated, and inspired. We bring before you the facilitators as well as the interviewer. We pray, oh Lord, that you will lead them. Thank you for hearing this prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Donna. Well, we are going to be having a very interesting time today because all ears, I am all ears. I want to hear what's happening with fostering children. And I'm sure that many persons want to hear also. So we have with us Karen Carberry. And Karen is no stranger to the forum. She's been one of our senior, <laughs> one of our senior um, moderators. And it is just so good to have her here again. She is a consultant, family therapist, and a systemic supervisor. And she is all the way in the UK. This is part of the reach of Choose Life International. And she is one of the members of our committee who plan all of these webinars. So without any further ado, I want to invite Karen Carberry to now take over as moderator. And she will introduce our guests and get it rolling. Thank you so much, Karen. Good to have you again. Thank you, Faye. Good evening, everybody. Um, this is a very exciting evening, or evening it is in the UK. It's actually, uh, we're just past midnight in the UK, so I'm up very late, but um, happy to be, to be up, to be able to have the privilege of talking to to very interesting and dynamic women. Um, so today we have Holly McFarlane, who is a, a director of a foster care organization. And uh, she's gonna tell us a little bit more about this organization that she is part of. And it's very, very important that uh, we give real credence to her, she's an absolutely dynamic and uh, 
We also have a lady called Rachel Davidson from Family Life Ministries Foster Care Program, who will also be here, who is a foster parent as well. And uh, we'll be talking today very much about a very important subject. You know, our themes that we have been doing across uh, Choose Life International has been very innovative and very important. And so this particular uh, webinar today, we'll be talking about the importance of strengthening relationships and fostering children. And that is such an important subject. We know from history that uh, the community in the West Indies have been very much about taking children in when they haven't been uh, with parents. This has been something that has been historical over hundreds of years. But this formalized way in which Holly has developed her organization has taken us to uh, on another level as well. And myself, my own experience on, on this uh, particular subject, I have worked in the UK as an independent um, panel member for fostering and adoption panel um, many years ago and I served on that panel for several years so our system is probably slightly different but I have a very interesting um, angle from the UK perspective. In addition to that I was also a, a partner in a, a um, adoption um, an adoption support agency, which also worked with um, families where there were permanencies well in terms of the foster care system. And I was doing that for about 10 years. So I have a vested interest in this subject and um, I'm very excited to be able to talk with Holly and Rachel about their work and their experience. So, we you know, Holly McFarlane, uh, who is the director there, okay. And uh, I'm gonna ask a little bit about her work, but I just want to say that um, she is also, not only is she the director of this uh, foster care organization, she is also an um, uh, adoptive parent as well. And she also currently fosters another daughter as well. And this work that she's been involved in is an absolute passion in her life as well. And, uh, and we will also talk with Rachel there, who's also there in the background, but we wanna talk a little bit with Holly. Holly, uh, welcome. Thank to you this so much for having me. So why don't you tell us a little about, bit about your, your actual uh, agency, the foster care program from Family Life, Family Life Ministries. Tell us a little bit about how did this become established? Okay. okay. Family Life Ministries has actually been providing family therapy services to Jamaica for over 30 years, uh, mainly through counseling, but we also have radio programs and we have an employee assistant pro assistance program. And so being involved in, in family therapy and in strengthening and maintaining families, this is the newest program that we have, which is really to provide families for children who do not have families. They're being raised in institutions, children's homes, as we call them in Jamaica, other persons call them orphanages. So these mm -hmm. children really have no families. Some of them have biological families, but the families are so broken that they're not able to live with them. And so they are really alone in the children's home, even though there are so many persons around them. And so Family Life Ministries decided to start a private foster care program. The Child Protection and Family Services Agency does foster care in Jamaica, and they're the only organization with the legal authority to do so. So Family Life Ministries entered into a service agreement with them in 2019 to start this private foster care program. And it's really um, geared towards the Christian community. So um, we make our appeal in churches and to other Christian groups and through 
avenues like this webinar that we're having. We're really trying to reach the Christian community to encourage Christians to, in obedience to the command and heart of God to care for orphans, to provide homes for children who are being raised in institutions. So that is uh, what a noble piece of work that you've been that's been taking place over 30 years. Wow, you look so young. You don't look as though you were even over 30. <laughs> no, I, well, I was. <laughs> I haven't been there for 30 years. This program <laughs> is actually very young. Our agreement with CPFSA was 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 signed in 2019, and mm -hmm. we started implementation in October um, 2019. So we're just about a year and a half, a little over a year and a half old. Wow. Um, but, but the family therapy services have been going on for over 30 years with Family Life Ministries. Okay, well, that's very helpful to know, actually. So this, you're on the cutting edge now of this right. new program, in actual fact, which is really, really important. And, you know, so, you know, your own um, experience of becoming a, a um, adoptive parent and a foster parent, how, how did that take its, its place? Oh, <laughs> that's quite interesting. Just my personal stories that I lived with my mother, my sister and my nephew. My mother passed away, my sister moved abroad. And so I found myself alone and that's just a strange way to be for me. Some persons are okay being alone. I love family. And I prayed about it and one day I was driving and I just heard, why don't you adopt a child? Um, but adoption is not very easy in Jamaica. So most persons just have to go the route of foster care. So I applied to foster and my first daughter came to me at that time. And a few years later, when she came up within the CPFSA for adoption, they contacted me to say, well, she's up for adoption, your first choice because she has already bonded with your family. And so would you be interested? I was like, yes, yes, yes. Cause I had prayed to God you know, and said, let me know when to apply for adoption for her. And they called before I approached them. Um, and so that is how my first daughter came to me. Um, wow. but when, when she came at first, it was mm. a holiday placement and it was actually two children who came, but being single, I wasn't able to foster both of them at the time. So one went back after the holiday. And then based on my volunteer work in children's homes, years later, I visited a children's home and there she was, nobody had taken her out of the system. So last year, September, I applied to take her out. So she's been with me since December. Oh, wow. And someone she's known before, someone that she's made a connection with, somebody that, you know, has a heart for her and, and a heart, for, you know, a mm -hmm. reciprocal heart for each other. And you were able to find each other again. Well, she didn't remember me because she was three at the time. <laughs> but what I'm happy about is that I took pictures of her at three. Because yeah. growing up in the children's home, you don't really have pictures. So oh. she was able to come into my home and see pictures of herself at three. And that was really a big moment for all of us. She just instantly felt that connection because she said, yes, I really have been here before. Oh, that is beautiful. That's really welcoming. I think those things are really important, aren't they? In terms of, you know, being able to see an image of yourself. It was almost like a divine intervention, the fact that she was able to come in and see, as you said, she may not remember within herself, been able to see herself in the home, was able to position herself in a home and feel a little bit more connected. Okay, so I'm going to ask you, you know, what does it mean to be a foster parent? What is a foster, you know, what is a foster parent? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, as you said before, um, Karen, fostering is part of our Caribbean culture. Many persons were raised by their grandmother, their aunt, um, but it was an informal thing. You just went to live with a person and they raised you. So that's informal foster care. Mm -hmm. But foster care is really a legal arrangement for guardianship. And so you enter into this legal arrangement with the government um, to take care of this child. So it's not your biological child, but you're given the legal, legal authority to raise this child as your own. So you're really providing all that the child needs and loving that child as if that child were your biological child, um, though there might be parents somewhere out there um, who, who are connected to that child biologically. So tell us a little bit about what sort of children would come into the life of a foster parent? Where would be they be coming from? You talked about sort of they would be in children's home. Uh, are there any other places they may come through? 
They're usually from children's homes because these are children who the parents have either voluntarily um, given, over, given over their legal parental rights to the government, so the child becomes a ward of the state, mm -hmm. or maybe the child's biological background is so broken, maybe the child is living in a state of persistent abuse that the government has moved in and said, we need to remove this child. So whether voluntarily or not, these children have now become wards of the state. And so though the parents have biological rights, the custody rights really belong to the government. And so they, them being in a children's home now, the government in trying to find living arrangements for them will enter into legal arrangements with private citizens to raise these children. And so that is how a child will enter into foster care. So even the children who come to parents through our program, it is the CPFSA, the government, that gives the children to us under a legal arrangement. And they come to us from the children's homes. So one of the things you talked about earlier, and you talked about your personal experience of being a foster parent and why you, um, you became a foster parent, what are other people's reasons, do you think? I mean, I, we'll talk to Rachel a little bit early, a uh, little bit later. But, uh, you know, what are other people's reasons for becoming a foster parent? All right. So I'll speak for our program because, um, as I said before, our, our program is with, within the Christian community. Yeah. Um, predominantly, the persons who we find becoming foster parents are single females, who want to share in raising children, want to help children, want to nurture children. And so they decide to go the foster care route. We also have married couples who probably have not had children and they've decided to go this route. Then we have couples who already have biological children. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we hear is, oh, I need a companion for my child. We, we hear that, we hear that a lot from the married couples. Um, and we have married couples also who have children, but I find in doing this work that a lot of persons are carrying around a deep desire to raise orphans, to help orphans in a real way. And, and so some persons in wanting a child and not having any, some they have their child, but they want companion, a companion for their child, or they've just always carried this passion to, to, to raise a child who is in adverse circumstances. So there's almost like a, there's a, uh, sometimes a calling for people to, to feel that they want to bring uh, mm -hmm. children into their home and also um, other families, uh, established families who want to widen their family yes. um, yes. numbers as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, you know, so some of these children, I think you've said, have uh, had some very difficult beginnings uh, or difficult experiences. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, what sort of what sort of things are they you know, experiencing while they've come into uh, the foster care system? Um, some of them are unbelievable. For some of the children, it might just be that their parents are poor and so mm -hmm. they're unable to care for them at this time or they don't have somewhere that is suitable to live. And so th those parents voluntarily hand over their child to the government for a temporary custody. And then when, they're, when their lives turn around, the children are replaced with them. But the majority, unfortunately, come from unspeakable um, situations of, of abuse, all sorts of abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, mm -hmm. um, verbal, emotional, all forms of abuse that you can think of and some that you can't think of. Because sometimes when I hear the stories, I wonder how the children are physically alive. You know, um, so they come to the system from really dire circumstances. And that's one of the reasons why Family Life Ministries has this program. Because when you enter an institution with this level of brokenness, trauma, and abuse, and you're in an institution, so you're not being raised with any sort of love and, and healing therapy, then at 18, when you're forced to leave this institution, who are you really? And how, are, how do you go out into the world now to navigate the world with all of this brokenness? It's just really very difficult and unspeakable. And so the sooner we can get children into loving families, the better it will be for the children, for us, and for the nation. Wow, with all these you know, levels of brokenness, you know, I, I understand we talked earlier about you know, uh, having worked with children who've had all sorts of 
difficulties, neglect, um, abuse. Maybe their parents have passed away and there's, you know, nobody to take take them in who, who can afford to take them in. Um, you know, um, I was just sort of wondering then, you know, are, what sort of um, training do foster parents undergo in order to prepare themselves to receive children with uh, these diverse range of brokenness? Training is one of the pillars of the For the Child Foster Care Program because it's, it's the children come so broken that you have to have some knowledge and some skills as to how to raise this child. Um, we, we, as, as parents, we have some general parenting knowledge, but it's going to take more than that because we have to know now how to raise a child who is now manifesting the, the impacts of trauma and abuse. Um, a lot of times those manifestations, people look at them and say, oh, bad picnic from children's home. And that's how we look at it. But it's not really bad picnic from children's home. It's a broken child to whom a severe injustice has been done. And that brain in that child only knows to respond in this way because there's no protective adult to help that child through that trauma. And so what we do in the For the Child Foster Care Program is to provide monthly training for our parents. And the training is not general parenting training, it's training in how to raise a child who is a victim of trauma and abuse. Those are the topics um, that our training surrounds. And what we do also is we teach the theory but well, the training sessions are done in, in a very sort of open and very organic way. So whatever challenges the parents are going through, they bring those challenges to the training sessions and we apply the theory to what is happening in the homes. And that's an integral part of the program. And because the program is so young, we keep realizing all oh, different things we need to do, different things we need to train the parents, you know, this issue, that issue. And so it's an evolving situation. We're, we're just evolving as we, as we go along. Um, but, but mainly the hub of the training, though it might have many arms, is helping the child to feel safe and secure in this relationship with the foster family so that the healing can begin. Because if there is no safety and no security, that healing is not going to take place for that child. So everything comes back to attachment, helping the child to attach in healthy ways um, to this foster family so that they can begin to trust that family and receive the therapies that they will receive in that foster home. So what we're hearing is that parents are being taught to be therapeutic parents, aren't they? Yes. Let me, when, when, when our parents, when the children reach 18, I think every parent should be given a PhD in psychology just for the, <laughs> just for the journey, because literally it's a lot of psychology that we have to learn um, so that we can't just run away from the job and say, oh, it's too difficult. No, the Lord has commanded it. Um, so therefore, he's going to strengthen us to do it. And so we have to equip ourselves then to do what the Lord has commanded us to do. And that's the challenging part. The, the good part is that when you see the transformations begin to take place in the children, believe me, the joy that you feel is so deep. We see children moving from being so broken that they're having manifestations of, of different types of mental illnesses. And then we see these children later and they're surpassing their peers who were raised in loving biological families because of the therapies that they, that they received. So the journey is challenging, but it is also rewarding. It's very, very rewarding. And I can say this within this forum because it's a Christian forum basically, that as you parent, prayerfully, we do see a lot of miracles take, take place in the lives of these children. We see the miracles, we see the hand of God in the lives of these children as we walk the journey, using, having him at the center of what we do. Thank you very much. Well, you know, one of the, one of the things that uh, you talked about earlier was that some children may come from parents of, from families that are very poor, can't afford to keep them. There's nothing wrong with their sort of parenting skills, but it's a case of economics. And uh, and on those occasions, there are 
when they've turned things around or when they've had some support to turn things around, that those children are reintroduced back into the relationship. So I was just wondering from sort of my experience that the, I, I used to run um, managed contact centres for separated divorced parents or, or children who are um, not living with their parents due to some of the circumstances that you've talked before. So I was wondering, is there, is there a contact arrangement that takes place between those types of parents who, you know, are emotionally healthy, if you like, but, you know, due to financial circumstances, aren't able to look after their children as a sort of, you know, is there a reintegration process when they turn themselves around with the support of your organisation? There, there is a contact arrangement. So parents who are deemed to be safe for the children, like those who it's just a matter of poverty, but I love my child. Those parents have supervised visits with their children. Um, so the Child Protection and Family Services Agency will have an officer who is present at the supervised visits with the children. Mm -hmm. And so the children are allowed to maintain that bond with their biological parent. And in a situation like that, the foster parent knows that what they're doing is really supporting this family. I, I love my child. I'm not giving up my child. I just really can't afford to take care of my child at this time. And so that bond, that relationship with the biological family is maintained through supervised visits um, throughout the foster care until the child can go back home. Okay. And, you know, the and so having that support helps to sort of make that transition. Mm -hmm. um, do they then also have sort of not just you know, contact sort of outside of those sort of form arrangement, perhaps a day away or a couple of hours away from that particular sort of con just on their own while they're being reintegrated back into the family? No, no, not to my knowledge. All visits with biological families are supervised by the CPFSA. And also the, child, the, the biological family members don't come to the foster home at all. The, oh, the surprise okay. visits are on neutral ground. On neutral ground. Okay, so that's really important about that sort of safety element yes, as well, yes, really. Right. Mm -hmm. And also that private element as well. Yes, you and have to give the, the, the I'm sorry, um, mm -hmm. you have to give the foster parents that privacy. Um, mm -hmm. You can't, I open my home to a child, not to a, fa not to, to a family. And so it's supervised visits on neutral ground. Okay, I think those things are quite important for people to know when they are thinking about, you know, you know what, what, you know, what is our, what are the boundaries for us here yes. while we're sort of working as well. And also there's the, the, that adjustment period when the children sort of then go home, they have to sort of readjust. Mm -hmm. And there's something about um, a foster parent being able to make it, make them feel that it's safe to go home mm -hmm. um, as well and not just safe to go home but actually able to release them uh, into doing and children kind of know don't they you know is it you know that they they have sometimes you know even with separated parents there are divided loyalties aren't there and I guess in terms of when you've been with a, a child's been with a, a foster parent and then being reintegrated back into a safe home, there, there are those feelings, both for the foster parent and also for the child. In, in one, one of the things with foster care in Jamaica, you know, in the first world where persons, it's almost as if you're paid to be a foster parent. So children come and go. In Jamaica, foster parents, the, the, the small amount of money that you get as a foster parent, you're really doing this because your heart wants to help broken children. And so the children don't come and go. Jamaican foster parents tend to maintain relationships with the children for life. Um, they have entered your home, not as a business deal, but as a relationship. And so even if the child goes back to the biological parents, the foster relationship does not necessarily just end and is severed. Um, because even if a child stays in foster care until he or she is 18, um, because at 18, you sort of age up out of the foster care system, government is not responsible for you anymore. That child remains a part of the family. There's no coming and going with Jamaican foster care. Um, you tend to maintain a relationship as long as that foster family feels comfortable maintaining that relationship um, with the biological family. So in the UK, it's, you know, the, uh, there is a sort of financial incentive. There's um, no financial incentive. There's no financial incentive. <laughs> it's all hard. 
a, 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 almost a career then you know or, although yeah. there is that loving aspect of being a foster parent but they are paid a wage mm -hmm. um, um and uh you know um and and there are additional other supports as well for this child so it's in jamaica it's very different it's very much that this is our child and we are financially responsible for this absolutely child. absolutely okay i wonder if it's a good time to bring in rachel mm -hmm. uh would you like to join us Rachel? Sure. Thanks for having me. <laughs> okay, there you are. Oh, Rachel, thank you so much. Rachel is um, Family Life um, on the Family Life Foster Care Program and uh, Family Life Ministry Foster Care Program. And you're a foster carer. So, Rachel, how long have you been a foster carer? Well, I've uh, been a foster parent over a year. Foster over parent, year. thank you. Yeah. Yes, over, over a year. year. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And how many children? Is it okay to ask how many children that you sure. have? Sure. Uh, well, I have one son so far. Hoping in the future to go more. Yes, because I need to go there. I believe in courtesy. If All right. Yes, I will go there. You okay. want to increase your family size? Yes, yes, I do. Okay. So, you know, so you've had your uh, foster son for a year now. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, how, how was this process for you in um, All right. um because you, you, you fostered your son over a COVID pandemic? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, about in 2015, I had bad fibroids and for years bleeding, and I had to do a surgery that would need to be so for that I can't have kids. Okay. Um, as Ollie mentioned, in Jamaica, it's very hard to adopt. The adoption process I started, so I just stopped and kind of give up. And um, couple, couple, about in last year, so forth, it came in church where they go around, as you know, it's in church and it came and I said to the Lord, Lord, is this you wanted me to, you know, kind of questioning because I kind of give up, hope to say, okay, I mean, because the truth is I love kids. I love kids. So when, after doing that surgery, and I can't, I really kind of had a rattle with God a bit to say, yeah. you know, what, what is this that you're doing to me and everything. But he had a plan. I did not know the plan, but he had a plan. So, but then when I heard it announced in church to say they're doing their own foster thing, I was like, okay, Lord, should I go there? And he said to me, the door is open. So the truth is I signed up. I didn't know what I was getting myself in, but I signed up and I said, Lord, this is it. Um, went to the training, the trainings are good and everything is awesome. I said, okay, yes, I'm in it full time. A um, couple months after they sent a picture of my son, I said to them, okay, Lord, this is it, and I love him, and he will be mine. If it's your will, let it be done. And, but the truth is, it's a challenging role. It's very challenging. I tell anybody that it's challenging. And as Ali said, the training, and we have that, but the truth is, training don't prepare you for what you're getting for that child, to be honest. It yeah. has to come from here. And if you don't have that heart to love the child, let me tell you something. Because the truth is, I can say, there comes a time when I feel like giving up. There was a time when I felt like I'm not going to do it. I'm tired. I can't manage anymore. But you know what? When you have family around you, and you have the, the we have a group in, um, in life where we just meet and talk and open up and the tears cry and everybody but I can say that let me tell you something every parent in foster care can say you know what they, they cry and they reach that button where they feel like they can't do it no more they, that's their brain because they, they have to look at it and say these children are coming from homes that are abused sexual molested everything they're coming from my son, he's four. He was born with a disease. They didn't know that he can walk or talk. So he's a bit behind or suffer. But you know what? It's love. It is love and I have to come from here. And I will work with him. I don't care. I 
he's my son. I don't care what people say, he's my son. And if you, I believe that God placed him in my life for a reason because he's teaching me. Believe me, he's teaching me. Because you have to have patience. And that's one of the that's one of the things. And I look at it and I was saying to other brother that it's not about money. I don't have money like that. I don't have it like that. And what you mentioned, what they're giving is not, but that's nothing. But you know what? It's done from here. I love kids. And when you have a heart and a passion to just pour out your heart, I want that somebody, I want that child. Because I look at it and say, you know what? To be honest, when I, I'm just giving you a brief in brief interval where when I was when I was at my break, where I feel like if I put him back, you know what? If he stay in the state until he's 18, he's going to become a minister to society. And I said, no, that's not my son. He needs to come out. That's my next doctor. That's my lawyer. No matter what it costs me, I'm spending my money to get him the teaching that he needs, to help him to be where he needs to be. He's nowhere there now, but he's going there. So I'm pushing my heart to let him have one. You know, just push out. And I believe that this is what God has called me for. This is what God wants. And I'm saying, you know what? I'm holding on. And I'm going, I'm going for, for a sister. I'm going for a sister. <laughs> and I'm going. But by God's grace. And I'm working with him. And then I encourage other mothers out there, other family members. You may not have much, but you have the home. You have the space. You have the love to give a child. You may have a child of your own. But the truth is, let me tell you, there's a lot of stigmatism out there. There's a lot regarding foster care. I can tell you because I've heard it. I've heard it before. I've heard, I've seen persons shy away from becoming such parent because of what they heard and what is happening. But the truth is you can help a child. You can give a child something that they need. You know, let me tell you something. When my son looked at me, tears come to my eye when the first time he looked at me and he said, mommy, I love you. I said, you love me? He said, yes, sure. And because he has a speech disability, let me tell you, sometimes it's so sweet just to hear him say, Mommy, the yum yum, the yum yum, mommy. <laughs> you know, and it, it brings joy to me. Uh, let me give you a little insight. The other day we were out, and as I, I might tell you, my son, he, he has grown from the first time from I got him. He has changed totally. He has improved. We were at the mechanic and I was standing, and he just came out of the blue. Mommy, wanted down and tired. I was like, whoa, he noticed. And he said, and I was, I was so touched, you know, just standing at the mechanic and he just come to me and he said, mommy, you want to go on the tire? And I was like, whoa, look what my baby, I did that. God did that to me. That's my baby. And, it, and I was so proud, you know, those little moments. But you know what? It's, it's, just, a, it's just a road that encourage parents to take. It's not about money. It's not about, but it's not about just you don't have that or you don't. It's, no, it's about having the woman, having the love in your heart to share with a child. Take that child from out of the system and just showing that love. You know how much parents I hear with, with who came and say, you know what? That's my, that's, that's my son. Yeah? Because of what? Foster. That's not a But then later on, you know, you can adopt. But the, because the truth is, my son, from the day he was born, he was in the system. Yeah. He's not one of those child that has a family alone. He's been in the system. So my home is the first home he knew. And he, he loves, he just, yeah, he loves it. He just comes and he says, Mommy, I love my heart. I love my dad. I'm hearing you saying, Rachel, can you hear me okay? Yes, I'm hearing you now. So what I'm hearing you saying is that, um, and, and I um, sort of that, that experience, one of the things I'm hearing you saying is that when the child comes to you, uh, to expect some regression, yeah? A child will, you know, so if you have a four-year-old child, don't expect the child to be a four-year-old child when they move into your home. Yeah. You have to start 
when you when you're talking about reparenting a child, um, you have to, to go back sometimes. Yes, you have to go back younger, and you know you maybe have to carry them around like you would carry around a baby, so that yes, they can feel really. your heart, feel, smell, understand the smell, all the things that you would do with a little baby. Yes, you have to. You know, because even though really the child is much older, because yes. they've 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 missed out on some developmental milestones in terms That's of so attachment. Yeah. Yes. Someone's asking what are some of the challenges and these are some things I'm hearing from you in your conversation yes. about some of the developmental stages would have been missed. So you have to go back and do those things and that takes unconditional love, a lot of patience. Oh, yes, you know, it does. A lot of so when you use the example that when you're at the mechanics and he says, I'm tired, I want to go home, people might be thinking, well, so... Well, what he's what he what you've done is allow him to um, connect with his feelings that would have been shut down, so that he now he can identify what tiredness means, and yes. he's not acting out in tiredness. He's actually been able to articulate that he's mm -hmm. connected to himself and understand he feels tired and he needs to sleep, and that is something to really celebrate. Yes, ma'am. Yes, it does. It does. And when I said he feels it's not him tired enough, it's me saying, Mommy, you want to sit down when you're tired? So he's telling me now that. And I telling want... you. He yes. can recognize that in you. Yes. He That's what I'm saying. So not only himself, he can recognize that yes, in you. So this is the yes. importance about attachment, about yes. recognizing the connection with their mother or their father about emotions, you know, if they feel tired, I feel tired, this is what it feels like, you know? Yes, and, yes. Not, and not acting in different ways that they feel rejected. And the other thing that I think sometimes happens, and perhaps I'll check in with you, is the honeymoon period. Children will come along, you'll have, they'll come into your house and you think, this is perfect, what a perfect child. You know, all my dreams of what my family was going to do. The child is perfect for a whole week. <laughs> and then the child starts to push to see whether you're going to reject him or her. Yeah. And, uh, to see, do they really care about me? Or, you know, actually, this is, doesn't feel permanent. They may not be able to articulate that, but they have a feeling of not being, you know, in a, in a permanent state. So they might feel a bit agitated their behavior might change. And this is where the training and the support groups that you talked about come yeah. together, where everybody can cry together and say they're exhausted, but also be able to share some wonderful nuggets of whether it's supporting one another, have you tried this? You know, I want to celebrate this, this is what happened. So it's important, it feels, to have an important um, um support someone saying here that their their perfect day lasted three days well, that <laughs> <laughs> worked in this field for a long time I could you know three days well wow, they must have been you know so those and that some of the behaviors that might occur as well I think some people might happen so one of the things might be around food you know yeah. food yes. because they yes. feel empty exactly yeah. right you know yeah, have this unsatiable appetite and you're thinking what's a child is a child going to eat me out of house and home what's going <laughs> on? Yeah. Yeah. So true. Uh, when I got him first there's certain because remember as what you mentioned earlier I have to be training him back again taste bud there's a lot of things I have to be going over he's like a baby back again because remember the form don't have, there's a lot of them, so they don't have time to do this or to do that to them, to spend that one-on-one -on -one with them regarding showing them this or letting them know what is happening. So with me now, I have to be doing that as, basically he's a newborn, so I have to be training him to do this and to do that or to be the different taste buds of food. Because still now, you know, if he gets some things to eat, take back, mommy, take back. So, you know, I have to break him little by little to say, okay, it tastes it, booby. It tastes nice. And mommy eating it. And, you know, gradually, and he'll come and taste. And, you know, it's just basically gradual. But as I said, he, the, 
kids because they're in the home, they don't get that attention they need, that one-on-one. -on -one. So when you get as a parent, you know we'll have to work with that child one-on-one, -on -one. show them what is it, start from scratch again, because that's a newborn you get, no matter the age. Ali can attest, she had a 14, but at the same time, what? It's basically a baby she had to go back again. You have to go back to baby, and especially right. for the children who were born in the system or yeah. children who are coming out of a lifetime of abuse, you yeah. really have to go back to the womb with that child. It's not just, oh, you're 11 and, and you're going to act like 11. You have to go all the way back. So we even lot of hug and kisses, lots of that. Give them a lot of that. A lot of hug. Let them know that, yay, you are there for them and you're not going anywhere. Because at times, no matter how they're young, you know, or he's young, or my child is young, basically. But listen, if I don't show him that love at the same time, a lot of hugs and kiss him and let him ensure that he's not going anywhere, he will feel like, yes, I'm just, you're, you're going to leave. Yeah. And you need to ensure the kids that you're not going anywhere. You're there for them. My family loves him. Let me tell you, when he's a, listen, I can't do anything. I remember, let me give you a little hint. Even when I was at my breaking point the other day, one day, I called my sister and I said, you know what? And my sister asked me if I was crazy, if I was mad to bring back her nephew. You're crazy. My brother, you know, everybody. So he's born with... Nighttime, he can't go to his bed without talking to Auntie Samantha or some, you know, he has the bond with the family and that is good. So is this, one of your, is this one of your tips then, you think, that if you're going to be a foster parent, that you need to have a supportive system, family system? Yes, yes, that is a term, so I encourage that, that is good. Have that around because when the child bond with the family, he sees that he's not alone and he's not just a one-on-one. -on -one. He has other family members around for support. So he can say, oh, Auntie Dato, I want to talk to Auntie Dato. And you know, that's him regarding that. So that's a powerful thing when he has that love. Or I, he can say, oh, let me wander to Auntie Twitter, wander to Auntie Twitter. Or you know what, he wants to go look for grandfather or something. Because he does talk, and his speech is not a hundred, as I mentioned, but he calls to say he wants to go there or he wants to talk to such and such. So, and I have to allow him to talk to them. And when he gets the phone, he feels love and he go and lie down and cup of him, put that in, I let him not wait, you know, <laughs> but he talk. But when you have that family bond going on there, and he's around other kids in the family, he loves and when he shows a picture, yes, that's auntie. And he can say that's Auntie Trisha, or he can say that Monique, or you know, that's because you know, he knows the names and the faces so, and everybody. So he's bonding around with the family and he grows, and that is a part of just sustenance to show that you know what, the bond is there. So, Rachel and Holly, you're sort of saying, as, as uh, you know, as single women, uh, or even as a single uh, um, foster parent, female foster parent, um, raising a, a young boy or a young man, it's important to have um, suitable role models. And maybe, as you said, because it's come to the church and back to the church or through your extended family, where they can see a, a, a male who, uh, who who operates in the positive and also can affirm the masculinity. Yes. Yes, um, it's around church where the man is there. Well, prayerful in the name of Jesus, he will send that husband for me to help father him. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, but um, he's around a lot, and he's, as I said, he's around my own, is my brothers and support. So you know they will talk to him because you know as a as a male child, you know that's a man, as a boy, when they put it part of a style, a boy, a boy in their Jamaica, you have to. Have him. You can't just let him down like that, you know, growing up. You have to start from young to hold him to say, this is it. And show him the way to go. So he has male figures around him who, you know, would sit him and encourage and talk to him at the same time and show him. So he's there. And he got, and that is good to have around sometimes. But, and, and I have to be rough too. I have to be, you know, can't be mommy, mommy, soft, soft. You know, I have to be a bit sturdy. I have to say, listen, no. And show him to say there. So 
it is not there and it, it can't be done. As I said, persons may think being a single parent, you can't do it, it can be done. Okay. So, so um, those are some of those tips. The other thing uh, is around, and we talked, we talked a little about, we talked a little bit about helping sort of wounded children as well. And I'm sort of quite aware that you would also, of in showing love, you talked about hugs and things. There are some children who've gone through um, different rates of abuse who may not want to be hugged, and I think that's important to. To share as a as a foster parent, you may have an idea an idea in your mind that you know a child's going to come into your home. You're going to be instantly be a family, or you know, or over time there'll be hugs and you'll be care. And there are some children who have been so wounded, um, and that it may not be appropriate to be hugging and kissing uh, that child. Um, for their own sort of mental health, and maybe yours too, actually, until such time that they understand what safe touch is. And yes, about that. so there's that thing, some specialist work. Um, would you say a little bit more about that, Holly? Well, one of the things about foster parenting um, is that we have to come to the table as foster parents with an open mind rather than preconceived notions. One of the things we mentioned earlier was not thinking that this child is four, five, six, ten. This is how they're going to act. That's number one. Number two, as a foster parent, while you're loving the child, you're actually stepping back because each child is different and you need to discover your child. You cannot um, impose or, or enforce as Rachel said, we're always learning what we thought about parenting. Foster, foster parenting has taught us that we know nothing about parenting. Because what you're really doing is stepping back and observing your child, trying to get to know your child, where the person is at, and then beginning the rebuilding there. So it's as you said, some children will come and they want a thousand hugs per day. Another one will come, say a child from a sexual abuse situation, and they really don't want that hug, especially if they go to a couple. So there's a male in the home. You have to think about how does the presence of that male affect the child? You have to be very, very observant and notice the little nuances in the child's behavior. You might say, oh, my doctor must be, my child must be a doctor, lawyer, Indian chief. And then the child comes to your home um, four years behind academically. Are you going to sit at the dining table every night and pump this child with GSAT? Or are you going to stand back and begin the process of rebuilding? Some children are eight and we have to take them back to kindergarten learning through play because they've never had a good educational experience. So we have to take them back to kindergarten strategies at age eight. And so instead of pushing the child to say, but at age you're supposed to know this, you're supposed to say, what does she know? What can she handle? Mm -hmm. So for instance, a child who is coming out of a children's home who is sitting online for school every day, I would never give them schoolwork when they come home because they're going through even just that big mental adjustment of being in your home. The fact that they can sit online all day is a miracle. Don't stress them with schoolwork when they come home, even if they're about to take the PEP exam. So it's really stepping back and trying to discover and understand your child in a very patient, it's, let me tell you the level of patience it is teaching me because sometimes you just want to go forward in what you think should be. And you have to literally hold back yourself and let that child come forth and understand what's taking place in the child and then respond appropriately and also strategize appropriately based on what you have observed. So it's really a big learning process, discovering your child and deciding, okay, what do I do with what I have discovered instead of going in with preconceived notions? Mm. So one of the things I was thinking about was that in, in a sense, a foster parent not only has to learn about um, different behavioral techniques, emotional responses, but also the neurobiology as well. Some, they're, they're going to become a doctor while they're at it as well in terms of understanding how does the brain work, how does trauma yeah. affect the brain. Can you say something about that, Holly? Yes, because um, one of the things that's very frustrating to parents is even just talking to the child and not getting a response, number okay. one. 
are talking to the child and wondering why is this child not understanding this simple instruction? And what we have to realize is that when a child is being raised without attachment, that means attachment to a loving, safe individual or family, that child who is not being given attention and proper nurturing and stimulation, it affects the development of the brain. We even think of the area of the brain called the prefrontal cortex, which is right behind the forehead. And that's responsible for things like self-regulation, self-management. People are always saying the children around children's home, them so wild, you know. Self-management is impaired. It's responsible for critical thinking and reasoning, um, for planning and control, for group work, working as a team. That's what that area of the brain is responsible for. When we understand that the development of that area of the brain is impaired in the children's home, then we now understand the behaviors that we get in our home. When you realize that the child's brain cannot do what you're expecting it to do, then you pull back and the patients begin and you begin that patient work of building now that prefrontal cortex because the child missed all of that. And so what we even notice predominant, the children who are raised in children's home, so even if they can do add, subtract, multiply and divide, give them a reasoning problem and it all falls apart because of that area of the brain that was affected. The development was impaired by being in an institution. So that is why I say even the training that we do with the parents, it's evolving and we have to get in deeper and deeper and deeper because to parent effectively and not become frustrated by the process, we have to understand what is happening in the brain of the child. So why they're behaving a particular way, why they can't do this, why they do this that way or that that way, we have to understand from a neurobiology point of view. That's really quite illuminating actually, because I was thinking, you know, some people, parents might be, or prospective parents uh, might be thinking, oh my gosh, I can't do all of this. This is, this is just too much work really. And, but as I was thinking, as you were talking, I was thinking, in fact, as they're learning about these children and the neurobiology, they're also learning about those things for themselves as well. Yeah, you know, thinking about well, how this might be why I responded in this way, mm -hmm. not so much the, the, the damages in the, mm -hmm. you know, because of someone's own upbringing, mm -hmm. uh, they have, you have to learn to do things in a different way or understand things in a different way mm -hmm. to then understand somebody else. And it then starts to make a bit more sense. And that's the beauty of having your support group, isn't it? Okay. Sharing knowledge. Yes. Sure, and, and also our, our, our parents, for instance, we have a parent who is a, who is a lecturer at a teacher's college. And so she, we were talking about a particular topic um, one night and that's something that she's highly trained in. So she just did a training session for the parents in the support group talking about yeah. neuroplasticity, which is the ability of the brain to grow and change. So, okay, so I got this child who came to me at age eight at, a, at the level of development of a four-year-old. I'm not going to know after that training, throw my hands up in the air and throw back the child to CPFC because now I understand that every brain can grow and change. So yeah. I don't need to become flustered that the child is eight and acting like four because every brain, that's how God designed the brain, neuroplasticity. It can grow and change. And so like Rachel is saying, we know where the child is at. And so we just go that slow, deliberate, intentional, patient journey of building the child up step-by-step. Step. Stop thinking about Dr. Lawyer, Indian Chief, and just build the child step-by-step step and see where the Lord takes that child. Amen. Not hearing you, Karen. Yes. Did you want to add anything to that, Rachel? Yeah, I just wanted to say that just as what she says regarding the child and the brain, um, it takes patience. That is one, that's one that takes patience because the truth is sometimes even before I get to understand my son, I, I, I used to get flustered very good because I have to be going, but it takes time and patience because he's four, but he's going back as a baby. I have to be starting over back again. The things that he should have known as a four-year-old. And the truth is, what I've learned since I got him, I don't compare my child with because I know what I don't do, don't do that. Don't compare because you can become flustered at that point. Because when you look at 
where a four-year-old should be and to see that he's four, almost five, and he's nowhere near there. I mean, nowhere near there. It can become a bit flustered. But you know what? It's just putting it and just working with him because you know where he's at. You know what he's capable of. And you know, so you take time with him and put and work with him. And he's moving. Believe me, when I got him, he's 150% better now because his brain is taking his and it's and he's going there. And he's getting there. The teachers recognize said, you know what? He's he's much he's growing. And I have to take the time out. Although I'm tired sometimes, but I take the time out and sit down and I do a little one one on one with him myself and work with him on. And then, no, you know, I can't leave everything on the teacher alone, you know. I have to do a little lot with myself too because I know he's behind. I have to work with him and see where he's at. And it helps a lot. Believe it or not, it helps. So we just have to be patient with them and work with them a lot. Thank you. So, you know, I'm hearing a, sort of a lot of things around, you know, when I was thinking, you know, what, is a, what does a foster parent look like? And you've given examples that foster parents are from all different walks of life you know from lecturer to you know you know any anybody someone yes, who's not right. doing somebody who's working so you know they don't look like anybody in particular you know yeah. a wide range male female single married you know older perhaps as well is there a cut of age for a foster parent um 65 the, the, the cut of age okay. is, well, that's, it's, that's, it's 25 to 65 25. and first 25 to 65 and persons on their application form can actually say what they would prefer whether it is short-term foster parenting or long-term foster parenting so for instance if somebody is a single 65 year old you wouldn't give them a small child because you don't want that child to bond and then in a few years maybe the person is unable to to take care of the child but persons can actually say, I want to do like three month foster care or six months, because from time to time, the CPFSA will have children who really it's a short term. Maybe the child is going abroad to a relative. And so in that six months period, while the legal work is being sorry, being taken care of, they just need a, a, a place of safety for that child. Um, but most of the foster care situations, however, are long term, but it's 25 to 65. That's the age range. And how would they how would they apply? What would they need to do now? And they've they've heard these wonderful stories about you know how enriching their lives can be, um, whether they're married or single. And you know um, what what can they do? Okay, well you apply through Family Life Ministries. Um, the telephone number is eight seven six eight one six zero eight eight nine. Or you can email us at FLM, as in Family Life Ministries, FLM Foster Care at gmail.com. That's FLM Foster Care at gmail.com. And then we'll take you through the application process. Okay, perhaps someone can put that, perhaps that can be put in the chat for that. people, perhaps as well. And, you know, I know that we spoke, Holly, um, we were talking about sort of older children, weren't we? And there's a question in the chat about teenagers, you know, yes. are, are they included in the foster care? It's, the it's, foster zero, care? it's zero to 17. Children okay. stay in the legal foster care system until they are 18. So any child zero to 17. And when you do the application, you actually put a gender preference and an age range preference. And so we try to match as closely as possible to what you require. And, you, and in terms of, you know, we talked about developmental stages for younger children and are these developmental stages similar for adult children as well? I think you mentioned 14, maybe look like an eight year old. Uh, yeah. So okay. um, usually, all the children are behind developmentally because when we look at the whole brain, we're thinking about, like we said, the pre prefrontal cortex, that's the high functioning, the, the, you know, the, that, that's the high level reasoning skills and, and cooperation skills and all of that. But then we look at areas of the brain that are responsible for social and emotional development. Mm -hmm. Those get impaired severely also. Um, we look at things cases of things like ADHD. ADHD is pretty common 
in children who are raised in institutions. And so any child who you get, who has been raised in an institution, um, you're going to find developmental delays in several domains. And, and so that is why it is so important not to have preconceived notions. And that is why um, Rachel is saying, you have to come from a hard perspective. Um, somebody had put in the chat that they thought that CPFSA gave some money. CPFSA does give $8,000 per month per child and Family Life Ministries gives 12. So persons who are in the CPFSA program get 8,000. Those in the Family Life Ministries program, they get 20,000. But even at the 20,000, we're Jamaicans, $20,000 per month cannot raise a child. And so it will require a lot of your own resources um, to raise this child. Um, at Family Life Ministries, we try to give as much support as possible. So for instance, if you, if you think that your child needs some sort of counseling support, we will give that to you free of cost. Oh, and then from the CPFSA point of view now, if your child has a major expense, like a major medical, a surgery, or something like that, they will assist you with that. I'm not sure what percentage of the cost, but they will give some assistance. But predominantly, you are the one who is taking care of that child. Um, as Rachel said, don't think that you have to be rich to do it. People have children all out there and they are not rich. What you want to, when, when, the, when persons apply, what we look for is financial stability, not mm -hmm. wealth. So we just want to see that you're reasonably able to take care of this child. And if something, for instance, we had a parent who she received an eight-year-old daughter and then she found out that, but this child is operating at a kindergarten level. And then the child needed to go to a special needs schools. One of our donors came forward and said, I will pay that school fee. So every term that donor would pay the school fee to family life and we pay it for that child. No, we can't promise that for everyone. But when these exceptional cases come forward, we try to find support. Right now we're trying to find support to give parents tutoring um, stipends for the children. Because if all the children are coming two, three, four, five years behind, then they're going to need one-on-one -on -one tutoring to help them to catch up. And so we're trying to put a formal system in place to secure funding, to help the parents because we don't want the children to be left in the children's homes because persons are unable to take care of them because it does require um, sometimes some additional expenses based on the child whom you receive. Mm. I think one of the things that you, which I think is fantastic, is that you provide therapeutic support. I mean, you know, you, you can't do this work with children without this type of therapeutic support in place, which is absolutely, you know, fantastic. You know, is there a waiting list for this? For therapeutic support? Mm -hmm. No, we, we, we don't have a waiting list for it because um, we, we, we don't have a lot of children in therapy. However, we do expect it to grow. Because then we had, as you say, the honeymoon period. One person said hers was three days. Then mm -hmm. we have the tearing out your hair period. What have I gotten myself into that, Rachel? Yeah. That you went through, that every foster parent goes through, you know, this, the storming stage of the group. And then you get a little bit settled and you say, okay, so this, this is what is on our plate here. Mm -hmm. um, how are we going to deal with this now? Some parents, um, through the training and all of that, and support, they find strategies for dealing with it. It's the parents now who say, no, this situation is really above my head. I have to get some um, therapeutic support for my family. So, so far we've been yes. able to handle all of them, mm -hmm. um, but we anticipate that there's going to be more in future. But yeah. Family Life Ministries is committing itself to he helping families with the therapeutic aspect of raising the children. Well, I just think that's absolutely fantastic and amazing. And, you know, um, there, there are a couple of things that somebody asked about uh, in terms of, um, in terms of uh, traits that children may have. Um, and then not family traits, they've talked about. In a sense, if, you're, if you have children that are born to you, they're going to have similar traits to you, possibly, or even generational. I remember I had a conversation yesterday um, it was talking about my brother who's never met one of my uncles who wasn't Jamaican in the States now. So he looks identical to my uncle, my mother's um, 
brother, elderly brother, and he just looking at my brother and having to meet this uncle who never met each other. They hold the head the same. They laugh the same. They look identical. You would think they were they were um, father and son, and they had and they're not. But and they've never met each other. So in a sense. Of course, you'll see that there will be genetic traits that sometimes will be transferred through two children. And, you know, but at the same time, they will also learn from you as well. So there's something about, I think, you know, we, when we talk about this perfect child, sometimes um, parents, foster parents, adopted parents have an idealized of what this child is going to be like you know, in their hearts, if they had a child of their own, what this child would be like, and then wanting to form that child into the ideal. And I think, you know, it's important that the parents, foster parents, adoptive parents have that space to work through that idealized process, to let that go and to focus on the child that's in front of them as well. And so, you know, the work that you do is absolutely amazing. So we're going to take a break now. I'm going to do an announcement. Thank you, ladies, if you just pause and we'll come back to you. Over to you, Faye. Wow, 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 wow. We are in the forum of Choose Life International webinar number 124, and it is a riot. Oh, my goodness. Just talking about strengthening relationships and and fostering children you know with our resource person holly holly mcfarland doing an excellent job there wow thank you Holly, for being with us and rachel oh my goodness rachel is just full of so much energy and vibes and Oh my goodness i understand why you were chosen rachel Absolutely. wow and just to listen to the love and the excitement that you bring. Simply wonderful. Fostering. Fostering children is very, very, very important. And as was mentioned, the whole thing of Jamaica, fostering long term and, you know, not thinking about the money and all of that. Donovan and I have fostered two young people. And why? That, that was something else and one of them it was 20 years ago and we are still in relationship with her and the other one was about five years ago and we are still in relationship with him so fostering has a lot of benefit not only to the individuals the children but also to you who make this investment so let me do my announcements and then we're going to come back for the wrap up. All right. Where is my thingy? Oh my goodness. Can you imagine I'm not seeing? Oh my goodness. Okay. Let me try again. All right. So. I am not seeing my, my, my PowerPoint, but I am going to, oh, looks like it got closed. All right. Give me a sec there. Coming up next week is a new topic. And our topic next week is hoping with change coping strategies in a changing environment my kids are out of school now what all right i found my powerpoint let me bring it up back again here we go so my kids are out of school now what coping strategies in a changing environment and we have with us Mr. Samuel Smalling, President of the Deans of Discipline. He will be our guest speaker next week, Sunday, July 4 at 5 o'clock p.m. Jamaica time. So make it a date. 
what do we do with these children now that school is out? And the following day, that is July 5, we have same theme again, July theme, coping strategies in a changing environment. And we are doing the same topic. My kids are out of school, now what? And we will have Miss Casey Carr, who is the CEO of the National Parenting Support Commission. And so that is next week, Monday at six o'clock. So definitely we got to make it a date. Come on out and see what we're up to. Gear to Live TV show continues on Thursdays at 6.30 p.m. and repeats on Saturday at 6 o'clock. Check out mercyandtruth.tv. That's MTM. Some of you know it as MTM. And it's on Digicel and Flow. And also you can just check the live link. Of course, our prayer time comes up again next month, third Wednesday on July 21st, 7.30 a.m. in the morning. Come and pray with us. We have a wonderful time together. And guess what? God answers prayer. Ask, ask Rachel. Ask Holly. Yes, definitely. Consider giving a gift to Choose Life International. And you can check our website and check, check us, check us. And we just want to thank all of our guests from week to week who give up their time and their, their resources in terms of just what they bring to the table without any charge. Thank you so very much. Now, do you want a seminar or webinar in your organization? Call our office, 876-920-7924. One of the hottest webinars on still is managing the psychological impact of COVID-19. You've got to check it out. So call us. And we have a host of webinars. One, over 100 webinars on our website. Go to www.chooselifeintl.org. Check out our webinars that have gone. They are so impacting. Whatever you think of almost, you can find something there. So check it out. And do you need counseling? Call our office, 876-920-7924 or 876-856-2966. It's really been our delight to have this webinar so far. And I just want to hand back over to our wonderful, engaging moderator, Karen Carberry. Thank you very much. Over here in the UK at 17 minutes past one in the morning. <laughs> we want to just sort of ask just the last couple of questions very quickly and then thank our wonderful guests for being here and just some takeaways as well. So um, the work that you've been doing has been absolutely amazing, Holly and Rachel. It is just really inspiring and inspiring so many people who are listening on uh, online at the moment. And, you know, there are some questions about children who are in the uh, Silver Children Home who may need the therapeutic support there and, you know, and you know, what can be done to help those? I guess that doesn't come under your remit. Um, but is that something that you think that the, that could, could happen? I, I guess in the back of my mind, I'm thinking if children are having that type of work, they need somebody to attach to. Uh, it needs to be safe. So rather than just developing therapeutic work, so, so the healing work that uh, then they are left or not, Parts of somebody no... who can work with the parental attachment. Maybe that is why that work isn't done there. And we could even take it further. Um, as Christians, we, well, in a pre COVID period, as Christians, we as a church has been going into, have been going into children's homes and teaching them the gospel, teaching them about Jesus. And they, when they come to us for foster care, they know the Bible end to end and it has no impact on their lives. There is no relationship within which the word is going to grow and take root and impact their lives. Um, 
And it's the same thing with therapy. You can go in and do counseling and give medication. If there is no love, no attachment, it is not going to work. And that is why globally, the concept of the orphanage is being dismantled. There are countries in which to set up a children's home is a criminal offense because science and research have proven that it is a failed concept. It literally destroys children in the name of helping children. Mm -hmm. And so that's why countries have moved and are moving away from it. And even the government of Jamaica is going through a care reform process at this time where they're seeking to remove at least 75% of the children from the children's homes into foster care and other types of families within the next three years. It's a lofty goal, but it's a start. Mm -hmm. And there's also a zero to three policy which says that no child under three should enter a children's home mm -hmm. ever again in Jamaica. And in fact, a three month old baby came to our program recently under that policy. They are not to go because the moment a child enters the children's home, the impairment begins because of the lack of attachment. I'm just there in this room of people. I'm attached to none of them. So I'm really defending myself, taking care of my, yes, you feed me, but I'm really the master of myself because you are not responding to my needs. And so the, the, the breakdown begins. And so it's a failed concept, the concept of the orphanage. And so countries are moving away from it completely. Thank you. So, you know, that's moving away from institutionalization. Institutionalization of children. So of when children. a child is in need of care, that child should enter a family, not an institution. That's the global direction yeah. in which things are going. So in a sense, that answers that last question about how does a child's inability to trust as a result of previous abuse affect the relationship between the foster parent and the foster child. So because there is no relationship, that has been taken in the intervening period, you know, there's a, the, there is the, um, the impact, um, impact on the attachment cycle. What does a child need? How does the child show it? What do mum and dad do in order to show the child, you know, to, re to respond to the child who needs? And then how does the child feel? That whole attachment cycle is then impacted and that's how the inability of trust takes. So I think that's, you know, wonderful, really. You know, there's quite a few questions still coming up. We are going to start closing down now. Um, it says, what they need to do is pass a law, wards of state to be released for adoption after being in this institution for more than three years. Well, I think adoption takes a long time for, for a reason, doesn't it, really? But well, part, of, part of the care reform process is really to make adoption um, easier in Jamaica. It's really a frustrating process. I've never heard of anybody who has gotten a child out of a children's home to adopt unless that child was in foster care with them first. What I keep hearing is people who have been on that adoption list for years and years and years until they just become frustrated and give up. And so that's why we say to persons, if you want to help a child, foster care is how you're going to have to do it. There's, it, it is, um, the position now that they're going to make the, the process better, but it's just a wait and see as to how the care reform process will unfold. Okay. And as someone has said, who's been on the foster and adoption panel and seen that whole process that can take in the UK, um, can take some time for them until we get to the matching process. I think, you know, that is really a good takeaway. So one of the things I think, um, Holly McFarlane, Rachel Davidson, you have been fantastic. Uh, Holly, the work that you're doing in your organization is outstanding. And, um, you know, from a, a Christian base as well, can you just tell me what is your favorite, your favorite Bible verse that keeps you going in the, those times when, you know, you really need that extra oomph and that where you want to so lay yourself on the line and say, Lord, just take me through it. What, where do you go? Which scripture do you go to? Actually, I don't, I don't go to a particular scripture. Um, me coming to this work um, actually came out of a period when I was, act was ill. And you know, so you're at home and you're not working. And so I was just spending a lot of time um, with the Lord and it was a transformational period for my life. And I had been volunteering in children's homes for decades through my church, Swallowfield Chapel, and just personally. And one of the things the Lord revealed to me is that 
children will never be healed in a, in a children's home. It was when I had secured some funding for a children's home and when the lady who owned the home got the money, she was very happy. And the Holy Spirit said to me, that's not the main event. The main event is their deliverance. And the Lord said to me, they will not be delivered in the children's home. They need to come out into families. And he did not even say foster care. He told me straight up adoption. Um, but I'm in this foster care program because I realized that um, foster care is part of the journey. Yeah. Part of the journey. So that's why I'm in this program. So it is out of that revelation that the Lord gave me that I'm doing this work. And it is what fuels me to go on. I mean, it, it literally consumes me now, Karen. I mean, I'm reading psychology and psychiatry like I'm reading. Nancy Drew as an 11 year old. I mean, it, it, it consumes me. Um, I have my two daughters and I parent them very intentionally because of all that I'm learning. Um, just like just like Rachel is doing with, with her son. You, you, you get to understand that raising them is really a different kind of, of parenting. Yeah. Um, and you just have to be patient. You, it really yeah. gets you into a different space with God when you have to raise a child who is broken and traumatized because it is a slaying of self completely and understanding what's happening with this child and being poured out like a drink offering, as, as, as Paul said, for the sake of the Lord and his child. Um, that is why you're doing it. And so these are the things that, that, that fuel me. Um, I, I, the way I put it to persons is this is a fire that is shut up in my bones. Everybody has a fire shut up in their bones. <laughs> Rescuing yeah. orphans is a fire that's shut up in my bones. It's it's shut up in cannot, bones. It, would be, it would be harder for me not to do it than to do it in spite of the challenges. That, that is how much um, this is a part of who I am in, in Christ. Thank you, Holly. Rachel, uh, is there a picture that you would offer to anybody that helps you? Or me? All right, for me, for my, for my scripture that I look to at all times is Proverbs. It's a trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lead not on thy own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him and he will direct thy path. Let me tell you something that has stopped with me from ever since. And that's one of my favorite scriptures. So when it comes on to the time, what it's telling me is just to trust God. Trust him because he doesn't give you the basket if you know you can't find a way out. If you can't carry that watch, I will not give you the basket. And I just need to trust him that there is a way out. And I'm going to see my son read. He wants me to read to him at night. He wants to hear the, his Joseph story, his David story. He wants me to read the Bible. That's how it comes to know. And I feel so, you know, going to, we have a little story book that I got, a prayer book, and I have to read to him. He'll call me, Mommy, read, read the book, read the book. One to And, you know, it, it's just my thing with, with him. And he prays. Sometimes, when, when, he, when he got his dinner, he prays. And when, sometimes I even the car, because we do a thing, we're a little devotion in the cars in the morning going, coming to work. And he will even start praying before I even say, well, baby, pray, pray now for me. He starts. So, and even on Sundays for church, I know it's online, he watches. Mommy, want to watch church? Want to watch church? And he's there, and I believe that, you know what? God is using me. God is using yeah. me to reach others, and he's using and I'm grateful. And that's why I try to encourage persons. As I said, you have the home, you have the heart. Go ahead and do it. Go ahead and take a child. You may not know that child may come out to be. Exactly. Listen, you don't know what is it that, or who is it that you're saving. Because the truth is, you know, some of these children in there, all they need to know is love. All that is now. what they need to get, just love. Some of what I've heard you mention regarding some who have been abused and don't want to be touched, I do understand that. To be honest, I do, because I've had persons around who have been in certain circumstances that you can't touch them, but it takes a while sure. for you to how it's how you deal with them. It takes a while for them to grow to trust you. Because sometimes, you know, in life, you know, or in, even in the homes, is somebody who they trust abuse them 
or molest them or in some way or the other. So to, to that come in your home, no one but you, but them, it's hard. For them to let go and try to trust, it's hard. So you've got to have patience and take time. So when they tell you, I'm going to sit down and cry with them too, you know, to be honest, you're going to sit and cry. You are going to cry because you're going to have to cure yourself. So many times if you are doing something wrong, but you are not, it's just, you just have to give them that time for them to come. And you'll be so surprised to know that they finally found somebody that they can trust and come to a talk to, to say yes. And anytime that trust builds, let me tell you something. It is. So I'll encourage everybody to go out and give your love to that child. Thank you, Rachel. So tonight it's been Strengthening Relationship Fostering Children. We've heard that you can foster children up to the age, you could be, as a foster parent, you can be up to the age of 65. Okay, there's no retirement here, is there? <laughs> up to the age of 65, there is plenty of support. You know, um, Holly McFarland's talked about the work they do at as Director of Foster Care Program, Family Life Ministries. And uh, Rachel Davison has talked about her experience as well. We know that children will be uh, regressed when they come to you, but there is an opportunity to help them through love and through parenting, through therapeutic parenting, and also knowing that you're not alone, that there is a fantastic support group as well that will help you. And there's also um, um, a little bit of money to help you along as well, but you do need to be... Uh, financially stable in order to foster a child as well so you know there are plenty of opportunities if you want to build your family or start your family in a way that's different to some of the um, alternative methods or traditional methods there are children who are waiting to come into your home and to receive love and by the grace of God if you've heard uh, calling through listening to this webinar today we pray that you reach out and contact Holly and our organization. Uh, you have the details. And um, if you some of these have touched you and you need some uh, therapeutic support, Faith has already um, mentioned that it's important to contact Choose Life International. So they're working together in partnership. It's a wonderful thing. And we thank you again for joining us today and have a blessed evening. All right. Thank you so much. Wow. First of all, thank you, Karen, for so ably moderating the program today. Wow. And to consider that you're still alert at 1.30 in the morning in the UK. Thank you so much. Thank you, Karen. Thank you to Holly. Holly. Holly, Holly, Holly McFarlane. <laughs> McFarlane, that's my maiden name. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you to Holly McFarlane and to Rachel Davidson, both of the FLM uh, foster care program. Wow, we were so blessed to have you both. And before you go, we're going to have Kim Baby Thomas pray for you because that's one of the things that we do at the end. We pray for you. And so, Kibibi, come on up, please, and pray for the FLM foster care program and for anyone who is thinking of fostering. Sure, sure. Good evening, everyone. I was also so blessed. Thanks, Karen, Holly, and Rachel. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for these moments we have spent together, Lord, talking about what is on your heart, Lord God, and that is how to take care of the fatherless. Lord God, really, this is your work, and we thank you for FLM. We thank you for CPFSA. We thank you for all of the various support groups that are out there, the resource persons, Lord, those who are are fostering those who are thinking of fostering. We thank you, Lord, because indeed you are the one who, have, who has moved upon their hearts. Lord God, you are you are faithful, Lord God, watching over these children and you are moving people into place. 
Heavenly Father. So even now I pray that your will would be done, Lord, through these organizations. I pray, Lord God, that as they put their shoulder to the wheel, Lord God, that you would you would grease it, Lord. You would bring all the resources. You would bring the people, Lord. You would change the policies that need to be changed. Heavenly Father, that, Lord, everything would be put in place, Lord God, for the welfare of these children. Lord God, how we give you praise for those who are already in foster families. Lord, you, you set the lonely in families. Lord God, you are so compassionate. We thank you for that and how we pray for stamina for the parents. Lord God, increase patience, Lord, wisdom and knowledge. Lord, a heart of love. And we pray that these children will continue on a healing journey, Lord God, by your grace and by your Holy Spirit. And that they would come to embrace their foster parents, Lord God, and that this relationship would be life-giving. Heavenly Father, we pray for wisdom for Holly, Lord God, as she heads up this program together with her team, Lord, including Charles, Lord God, Rachel, everyone else who, who is there. Heavenly Father, we pray for wisdom. We pray, oh Lord God, that they would walk in step with you, Lord, even as their zeal is bubbling and they want to see things done now, now. But Lord God, we pray, Lord God, that you put things in place and that you would show them what to do per time, Lord God, and that indeed in, in so doing, Lord God, they would avoid the darts of the enemy, Lord God, who wants to take out these children's destinies. But Lord God, they would be partnering with you, Lord God, for raising up the, the destinies of these children. So we pray for divine wisdom for them, Lord God. We pray that you would bring their divine help us, bring the networks, Lord God, that they need. Heavenly Father, and that there will be unity in these teams. Lord God, we pray especially for Rachel, Lord God, and Holly as, as foster parents themselves. Lord God, that indeed, Lord God, you would reward them, Lord God. We pray their sleep would be sweet. Lord God, you would dry their tears and open up their understanding. Lord God, as they face the, the new phases, the new stages that their children go through. And we pray this for every foster parent on the call and those who are in the program. Lord, we hand everything over to you. Thank you for carrying, Lord God, and her heart to stay. Lord, at, at, this, at this hour of the morning in the UK, Lord God, and may she also be blessed. Lord God, we give you praise. We thank you for CLI, Lord God, who has made the space for this issue to come to the fore, Lord God. And we're looking forward to many testimonies in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Kibibi. So, 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 so. We are going to, to stop the recording now. And uh, Holly and Rachel, just stay with us a little bit. And anybody who wants to throw some love on them or say anything to them afterwards, please stay with us. Thank you again. What a wonderful evening talking about fostering children.